Now, let's hear the artists. It is my pleasure to announce uh, Mrs. Desiree Dibasen Nanuses. She is the acting chief curator and collections curator for the National Art Gallery of Namibia. Mrs. Nanuses, welcome. My name is Desiree Nanuses, and I am the National Art Gallery of Namibia's acting chief curator. Hashtag What's Your Story was a project that we opened on the 9th of November and it ran until the 27th of March. This project was initiated because in a time of COVID, we knew that uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, we knew that we needed to help our artists position themselves in a global discourse, also on virtual platforms. And we needed the artist's voice to be their own voice and not the curator's voice that is telling their stories. Therefore, the initiation of this project was a introduction into what the artist wants to say about themselves, what they are comfortable putting um, on virtual platforms about themselves. And it and we were part of this process from beginning till the end where we said, we just want you to introduce, so tell us what it is you want to do. What is it that you would like to create? We didn't ask for a final artwork. We said, we want to be a part of your creative process from beginning till end. And when this project kicked off, it was so exciting because we built our gallery spaces, our studio spaces, artists could work in public public art spheres, they could let us know if they would like to work on a public art scene and um, we got um, the, the city of Vintuk involved, we had permissions from them where the artists could execute their, their ideas that they wanted to materialize and um, we were a part of the process from buying the art material for the artists whilst they were creating they had curatorial support from the National Art Gallery and until the finished project we framed the work and then we set it up as an exhibition and in this process of them receiving the artwork and creating the artwork until the final exhibition their entire process was documented visually in film in photographs and everything was being posted um, on virtual platforms so it was never a situation where an artist um, was not present but it was more the artist who was the only one present in that moment who has been able to speak about their work, what it is that they want to say, what is the story that they want to tell, what is authentically theirs that they would like to put to the rest of the world about themselves. And the final videos that for each and every participating artist, which was 82 in total, the final videos ended up being a YouTube channel for the National Art Gallery that was open. And these videos you can see currently on www.nagn.org.na and um, each artist's creative process is there where they talk about what their idea was and then you are able to see that idea where they're able to create it and what is in the final product, which was an online exhibition as well on the Nagan website, which is www.nagn.org.na. Hashtag What's Your Story was an introduction also to public art in Namibia. We find ourselves a lot in places where we had to queue up, um, where the, the towns was empty, there was no cars, no people moving about. And of course, we wanted to find out um, how can we also help people with their psyche? We always look at art as a therapeutic tool, something that can help your mind, that can help you cope amidst a, a, a pandemic or a stressful situation or a circumstance and um, how art is used in, in therapy as well. So we wanted to introduce public art as a form of this to provide that platform where if someone is going through a situation where they are a, queuing up to buy um, their flu medication, for example, that they would be able to see public art and, and it would take them away to some other place. That it's not, they're still not just seeing and hearing COVID, but that they are able to experience something else. And that was why um, the introduction to public art was the first for, of its kind for Namibia with this project. In addition to that, what we realized happened is that artists really, they had the freedom. We didn't limit artists' creative processes. We wanted the artists to be able to create a large work, for example, if they needed to, and not be limited to a, a bedroom that they are working with, for example. So of course, we had situations where in the National Art Gallery, our studio spaces as they were available, the artist's creativity was fully supported, and we, create, we received really, really amazing pieces of work. And I would just like to mention a couple that I think is very, very important. I mean, um, when we speak in a time of 
decolonization and decolonizing art and, and the, the public spheres within which we function. The most important for me is that we don't just adopt and re-adopt the white cube phenomena, but that we reinterpret it most authentic to or most of, of stay authentic to what it means for us so that we are able to present ourselves as best as possible. So we make use of the spaces available, but then the artists and their stories came through so powerfully. And the one artist I like to mention right now is Davido, who we came to know him as a painter. He went to art school, he studied as a painter, but then he ended up working in a graphic design studio um, for the paycheck, you know, and then for What's Your Story, Davido has presented us with a work, I mean, this, the technique he's used is pointillism, um, so it, it really looks like this pixelated image, right, and, and obviously we understand that it comes probably from where he's been, the type of work he's doing, but then when Davido was being interviewed for the What's Your Story, he said he called them Mahangu grains and I and because he comes from Oshivambu background it immediately authenticized to me what he is who he thinks he is and how he's translating what he knows to his heritage and connecting that to the indigenous knowledge that resides within him another artist that I would just like to bring to the fore is Hage Mukwenje um, there was an iconic image that went around when COVID came about in Namibia about these young boys um, you could see that they literally each probably off the, 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 the dumps but then the boys had to put on um, spar a shopping uh, a shopping complex plastic bags as masks over their mouth and and nose and this was a image that was shared around people were like where are these boys we want to buy masks for them so it's a space where the pandemic happens and um, we are unable to even take care of the most vulnerable in our society and in this time when this image started going around people's humanity came to the fore people stood up and wanted to support each other and help each other and Hage repainted this image that we had seen so much on social media in that time and it is one of the works that is uh, that was um, sub um, that he completed for the what's your story with these boys with these plastic marks and I, I think it's a thing that will remind us our humanity how we need to look out for the next person um, as much as the pandemic brought with it a negative it actually helped us be there for each other in a humane form as as human beings and it is amidst this time where I feel with this project we were able to present to the artists an alternative not only selling artwork physically in a, a space or physically on um, um, by the side of the road but that they are able to access other avenues to be able to sell their artwork and that in that that is how we are trying to create a resilience and a persistence amidst the pandemic so that this is our continuum this is our new normal moving forward even with the new projects that we are coming with we would like to keep continuing this momentum where artists know that it's not only a physical exhibition where if a tourist comes in and and, and doesn't see the work then there's no sale for example but that there is a way to have a continuum of sales beyond the physical physical exhibition spaces and I think it is also very synonymous um, with this conference where we can be from different countries but have the same conversation and I think in uh, in the time of a pandemic this is the, the resistance that we are able to come up with becoming more unified to be able to tell a story with different narratives and including all these perspectives into a whole. I will now read a statement by uh, an artist called Davido Indingo, a Namibian artist who has sent us his written address due to him being on a trip and not being available to participate live in this con co conference. An illustration is following. Youth having difficult times selling Oshivambo traditional food or fukwa during the lockdown times. Business hasn't been good during the lockdown. It affected the livelihood negatively and pandemic adds to informal vendors' challenges. Why street vendors are hit hard by COVID crisis? Street vendors, market traders and market porters earn their incomes in public. As street vendors have always faced onerous regulations and punitive measures by authorities, including confiscation of goods and arrests. But now 
the imposition of local and national lockdowns to contain the spread of COVID-19 is threatening not just the livelihoods, but the very survival of informal vendors and their families in some places. Initial Namibia economic stimulus measures favored big business and the well-connected. Grants, training programs, and low interest loans designed to help more street vendors get established would steer support to Namibians who are less wealthy and more ethnically diverse. Encouraging this kind of entrepreneurship with its low entry cost is a small but significantly more equitable way to stimulate the economy. Street vending offers still more benefits. It enlivens urban public spaces and increases public safety by making streets more vibrant and welcoming. Promoting street vending can generate employment and help their own families keep people safe and create the vitality and comity that is the hallmark of the livable human cities. This was the statement by the artist who has sent this statement to our conference in written form. The name of the artist is Davido Indongo from Namibia. Now, let's hear Dominic Maya Tanner, director of the ELA Gallery in Luanda in Angola. Here you are, you are welcome. Contemporary art of Africa in the era of the pandemic. Hello, my name is Dominic Alexander Maya Tenner. I've been living and working in Angola for 12 years now. For the past six years, I am founder of the art space Ella Spaslwanda Art, which in Portuguese means she, and is my tribute to women and the fundamental traits of being a woman. We are a leading gallery in Angola, working with contemporary art from Africa with a special focus on Angola. Question one. Did the pandemic change the way your gallery works or some ways of exhibiting contemporary art? This is a, a very important question. Uh, and this pandemic has come to show how much we are interconnected, both nationally and internationally, and the importance and impact each solitary act has in the collective. Despite being, I hope, in the exit of this pandemic, it is still premature to draw conclusions. But we can see that if the economic crisis had already caused enormous difficulties for Angolan visual artists, then COVID-19 and the obligation to close galleries, cultural centers, commercial spaces, and condition access to artist studios has ultimately created enormous financial problems for all those involved, resulting in fewer art, in less artists, and in the closing of, few, of the few galleries that exist, ultimately causing a poorer supply of art and culture and consequently a setback in awareness and education of the arts by the public. The entire visual arts sector and ecosystem has been weakened tragically. Question two, what are the challenges and how are you dealing with them? Again, this is a complex uh, question, but I would say that our main challenges are two. On the one hand, in Angola to create new local audiences. We have to educate the local public who often still confuses handicrafts with art. I personally feel that there is an international thirst to know Angola, but we must create an even larger thirst within Angola, for example, for artists, Angolan artists, to study uh, the Kianda, which is the Angolan mermaid, or for Angolan artists and, and the public to get to know what Kalunga is, which is known, uh, it's a Kikungu word, which means the threshold between worlds, and which was a term which originated during slavery. So again, I think we have a huge task to create new local public. On the other level, our priority is also the development of Pan-African research and dialogue. Hence, the project Angola Air, which organizes artistic residencies in Angola for non-Angolans. We want to contribute positively to the deconstruction of the often bad image Angola has and help put Luanda on the map, on an international trail that may even be non-African, but that may have an African reading and approach. Right now, not only is there a desire for foreign artists to come to Angola, but also a greater desire for collectors to acquire Angolan art. If we create a local audience, these works can stay in the country. And if there is a Pan-African audience, 
they will also be able to travel through several countries, more specifically between museums and exhibitions. Question three. In which way has the pandemic influenced the work of contemporary artists in Angola? I would say that despite the endless number of art projects around the themes of the mask and coronavirus, I think the pandemic has largely castrated the artist's soul and energy to create new and seminal work. We have seen the strong emergence of virtual exhibitions and sales, but now there appears to be a light at the end of the tunnel and we appear to be heading towards the exit of COVID-19 where artists are producing new and important work and galleries are beginning to reopen and show this body of work to a physical public. Recently, UNESCO, with the support of the Angolan government and the American Schools of Angola, has launched a pilot program on the African continent in Angola with a project called Resiliart. Resiliart embodies resilience and art and aims at empowering artists between the ages of 18 and 35 who we know have suffered the most with this crisis in terms of joining and or surviving in the art market. I believe projects like Resiliart, as long as they are supported by private individuals and institutions, will help to create a conscious trend in providing much needed training, best practices and sustainable support to artists directly. Finally, I would like the Angolan government to choose this negative moment and give it a very positive turning point giving top priority to the creation of a Museo de Arte Nacional Angolana, whose initials spell Mana, which in Portuguese means sister. The blueprint for this Museum of Angola National Art has already been drawn up. It assumes and gives protagonism to the social and pedagogical importance that the visual arts can have in the cultural fabric of contemporary Angolan society. At the same time, I appeal to the Ministry of Culture, Tourism and Environment in Angola to be somewhat of a pioneer on the continent by digitalizing national archives and creating a website that makes this collection available to the world with texts in several languages. It is my honor to announce uh, the address by the Joanna Taya, the Angolan artist from Lisboa. Mrs. Taya, you are welcome. Hi, it's uh, Joanna. Taya from Angola. Um, so in this uh, situation of the COVID-19, uh, these last two years, um, there was moments that um, affected, the COVID affected in a practical, in a practical and uh, emotional ways. Uh, the practical was that in the beginning, uh, a lot of uh, compromises that had to be postponed but uh, at the same time there was room for innovation and room for uh, uh, interaction globally which created uh, opportunities and I was able to to do some exhibitions along the way uh, collective uh, digital exhibitions um, and um, also generally uh, I always try to turn any situation into a positive situation. At one point, I, it made me a little bit um, frozen. I admit the emotional side of it was maybe the, the hardest at one point, which made me feel a little bit um, groundless. And um, But then I also realized that um, I had everything with me, in me and around me, all my circumstances. Um, I'm very privileged to, to, to have a space where I could create and uh, eventually individually independently of what was going on in the world I could still create. So maybe the emotional side of this was mo the most challenging because I did feel dismotivated. I did feel like I lost a little bit um, of my my goals because I always had I always worked, but I, I kind of enjoyed having um, uh, some deadlines and I enjoyed to have some uh, separation in between stages, which in the, in, in, I would kind of complete my stages with exhibitions. And in this time, 
they were vir virtual and uh, virtual was a really good solution but at the same time it wasn't uh, the same experience it was kind of like uh, in and kind of an anum, anum experience i still think that the presential and physical exhibition has com a completely different impact emotionally and uh, physically and uh, so in meanwhile i decided to to study to go back to study because the goal was to keep on growing and keep on keeping on learning so i managed to study and that gave me a lot of uh, direction and um, and I also learned a lot in the process of uh, how to, to manage my time. Even I had uh, no deadlines, I made myself some deadlines, I made myself some uh, goals, which I, I achieved along the way. So looking back and in all this process, um, and also it's my personality that uh, I always try to, to look at always the positive sides and and rely uh, mainly on, on my, my attitude and in, on myself. So um, looking back, I think I did use the time um, in the most effective way according to the circumstances. Um, but I really look forward to be able to go back to, to meeting people and uh, creating uh, with other people and also exhibiting and interacting with the viewer. Um, but uh, yes, I did learn a lot. I did, I did um, two, po two postgraduate courses. <laughs> I managed to do two collections and I'm, I'm going to start now, after this video, another collection. And um, yes, and I kind of found, my, um, made me reflect a lot and uh, found new directions where, where I want to, where I was. I've learned more of where I was, so to give me room and reflection of where I want to go. So in that sense, um, yeah, I don't think things are going to change so fast. I think this is something we have to accept and something we have to, to um, just to take the most out of it. At the end of the day, it's, it's up to us how we, we deal with the situation. That's how I think um, the COVID is going to be around for a while and we just have to be creative and innovative and uh, positive and um, just uh, keep on uh, looking at uh, creating goals and, uh, and being practical in a way. That's, it's a discipline. It's a, it's a mental discipline as well, I think. So thank you for <clears throat> this opportunity and um, for allowing me to share my experience and uh, I hope uh, you enjoy. Thank you. I will now read a statement by uh, Mr. Rafael Chichukwa, Executive Director at the National Gallery of Zimbabwe, who also has sent a written address to our conference today due to the fact that he is preparing an exhibition, hence he was not able to participate in our live broadcast. This contribution to this conference comes at a time when the world is still in the circles of uncertainty because of COVID-19. Here in the continent of Africa, like any other part of the world, we got shaken and we are still trying to find our way out of this pandemic. Artists and cultural leaders' lives were shattered after having been used in hopping in and out, hopping in and out of international airports, restaurants, exhibition openings, art fairs and biennales. As much as artists are used to working in isolation in their studios, but the fact that many exhibitions and programs got put on hold, it meant that life will never be the same. Our social life got affected and here at the National Gallery of Zimbabwe and many other cultural institutions in Africa, this was a shock to our life. Our preparedness was tested and our online visibility was not in place and we had to fight, fight a fight. 
National Gallery of Zimbabwe Harare conversation was to be organized online. The idea of an online visibility became a new reality and with limited funds, we had to create this platform. As the new executive director appointed in September 2020, I was confront confronted with this new reality from March when I was in an acting capacity. Up to the present day, myself and my team, we are faced with the reality to rethink, reflect and redesign our programming. A Cuban artist's solo exhibition entitled Point of View was supposed, was supposed to open early March, but we could not. It remained in quarantine until November 2020, and we closed the gallery until January 2021. We just took down the exhibition on the 26th of March 2020. It is an exhibition that had spent more months in the quarantine and few months only viewed by the public. Artists whose shows cancelled are still nourishing the, the, the pain and trying to recover is a challenge and some have adjusted to the online platform. In my own opinion, the resilience of African artists got tested and it remains my hope that we will be able to rise up. As the biggest cultural institution in Zimbabwe, we are mobilizing resources to boost our online visibility and working with artists as well. Our current exhibition, Zimbabwe at 41, is from our permanent collection. As a gallery with a huge permanent collection, we have to make our collection work for us in these challenging times. Now, I give the floor to Mr. Mehdi Kodbi, who is the president of the National Foundation of the Museums of Morocco. Mr. Kodbi. Sharing culture is what we aim for at the National Foundation of Museum of Morocco. And in parallel, our actions on a daily basis. During the COVID-19 outbreak lockdown, measures have been deployed and almost all museums around the world were closed. As a reaction to this unprecedented situation, the National Foundation of Museum had spared no effort to keep close and in touch with the audience by incrementing it, its digital activists. This approach enables use to enhance the museum as culture and educational assets for every home. Among actions taken to serve that purpose, we maintain it a garden trade on our social network by posting in the way the range culture, cultural content covered, covering focus on paintings, educational games, contests, but also streaming of Moroccan classical movies. Even when the Moroccan Museum were forced to close their doors due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the National Foundation took actions in order to share the national collections with the world and the women engaged with the audience during lockdown by creating the hashtag Le Musée à la Maison. This approach helped use to fulfill 
the educational and informative objectives through, throughout digital content that neglected some of our best national and international exhibitions. It is certain that the impact of the pandemic and the damage that has caused far exceed our expectations. It is why museums are urged to erecting these strategies by offering innovative and creative solutions in an air of social distancing to answer the safety and comfort of the visitors and staff will continue to serve this mission by offering unique and immersive experience. It is time to hear Blessing B. Azubike, curator from Nigeria. One. My name is Blessing B. Azubike. I'm a cultural producer and an arts manager from Nigeria in West Africa. 2020 was a challenging year for everyone. Artists and cultural organizations around the world were hard hit by the pandemic and presently in 2021, the world is still trying to get back to normalcy. Late 2019, just a few months before the pandemic hit, I had started the Artist Ladder, an initiative for support opportunities, education and career advancement for artists and creatives. Um, when I started the Artist Ladder, just a few months after the pandemic hit, and there were curfews in various cities and countries around the world. And here in Nigeria, a 14-day curfew was imposed on the cities of Lagos, Ogun, and Abuja. It kicked off on Monday, the 30th of March, and was on through Monday, the 13th of April, 2020. And I wondered how we were supposed to go two months, or two, sorry, two weeks, doing nothing. So I came up with the Artist Ladder 14-Day Art Diary. Through this project, I worked with uh, some Nigerian artists to document the th uh, their, their thoughts, excuse me, as well as events in their environment. And so um, the artist kept some sort of artistic diary by putting out thought-provoking work daily, which was shared on um, social media. It was an exciting two-week journey as we explored the creations of these artists regarding the pandemic and relating subjects. As regards the inspiration behind this project, I strongly believe that it is the job of the artist to be a witness in his time in history. Um, in my opinion, it isn't just enough to be an observer, no. You know, the work of an artist um, must reflect, interpret, and document the times. So in the confusion and uncertainty that enveloped the world with the entrance of the pandemic, people turned to political and religious leaders for hope and answers. And I kept saying to myself, why can't artists you know, profile solutions or give hope in these times. You know, so this was what inspired the Artist Ladder 14 Day Art Diary. My vision um, was to see the artists dig deep into their hearts and intellect to come up with powerful messages to be expressed on their canvases or whatever medium they chose to express with. I knew that two weeks of staying home would become tiresome for everyone, so my desire was to keep the artist inspired and to create pure magic in form of art. In the first seven days, I let the artists soar with their ideas unguided. So, so long as they stuck to their agreed theme of documenting the stay at home exercise. But from the eighth day, um, we had varying themes still within the context of the pandemic, which guided the artists. Um, these themes were simple and very relatable, yet thought provoking, like If I Were President, which was one of my favorite themes from the collection because for weeks there was an uproar on social media as Nigerians expected to be addressed by the president. Globally, it was also apparent that the current situation at the time, that is plunging economies, the viral spread and the shocking death tolls was leaving world leaders in a confused state. So my thinking was, if the tables were turned, 
what we what would we do better you know what would we do differently i was basically saying to the artist imagine that you were president if you wore the crown of leadership or bore the title president how would you bring hope in a trying time such as this what would you say to the people whom you lead and or you know what would you do differently there was also the I'll hold your hand through this theme, which was the artist saying, I may not have all the answers, nor the power to control or even put an end to all that is going on, but through my work or through art, I can hold your hand through the tragedy, pain or fear that you feel. Another personal favorite was the theme, who do you say you are? which doubled as the self-portrait theme. My thoughts were that in that period of self-isolation, um, a lot of people seemed to honestly be meeting themselves for the first time. You know, before then, the world was in so much of a hurry. It was as though there was no stop button. When the pandemic hit, the world, um, sorry, when the pandemic hit the world unannounced, everything was forced to shut down for the first time. You know, um, many were able to hear themselves, see themselves, spend time with themselves. And it would seem that, you know, a lot of people were meeting themselves for the first time. So with this theme, the artist presented a self-portrait created by taking an inward look and giving a glimpse into what their reflection was like when they looked into that proverbial mirror. It was also rather interesting as artists usually would have others as their subjects or muses, but rarely ever themselves. And you could tell that a number of the artists struggled with this particular theme. In the end, some of these works were comforting and, you know, perhaps a ray of hope or sunshine during what may be termed a time of darkness. Other works were a bit like what I would call lamentations, you know, mirroring the conditions and echoing the experiences and thoughts of the populace. In general, the feedback was positive. The artists were thankful for the opportunity and I was glad that one of our goals for the project was achieved, which was to push the artists because ideally one piece could take weeks, you know, even months, some take years to complete. But these artists were pushed to create daily. They were also pushed to mentally task themselves to work within the scope of varying themes each day, as well as apply themselves to the interesting times we find ourselves. The project also got some media attention one of the top tv stations in the country featured the project and one particular newspaper article about the project gave the rather apt title where there is art there is hope a female artist who participated in the project gave me a call last week expressing her gratitude because the pieces she created during the art diary have continued to enjoy exposure and even win her cash prizes up until last month which i found intriguing considering that the project happened a year ago in 2020, everything got grounded due to the pandemic and the arts was especially hit, with festivals, concerts, exhibitions and the likes coming to a complete halt. The only solution at the time to keeping the arts running was digitally, so I'm honoured that the Artist Ladder 14 Day Art Diary was birthed and played its role as a way of keeping the arts running and relevant in these times, as well as helping the artists adjust to the new reality. We have with us one more gentleman, Mohammed Saudi. He's the artist from Egypt. Mr. Saudi, you are welcome. Please continue. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Saudi. I'm an Egyptian ceramic artist and uh, participate in uh, several uh, local and international exhibitions and symposiums uh, here in Egypt and in Serbia and in Poland and in Latvia and in Spain, Croatia, uh, Croatia. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity to participate in my experience of working in a turbulent situation of coronavirus uh, surrounding us. I was nominated by uh, the Egyptian Ministry of Culture to open my second uh, solo exhibition in December uh, 2020. In the beginning, uh, the museum director informed me uh, that we have to take all possible uh, precautions to avoid infection uh, to encourage people who are interested in fine arts to attend the exhibitions, uh, such as reducing the attendance rate in the hall to 25 uh, and not allowing more than 10 people uh, to enter the exhibitions uh, hall uh, in the same time. Also, not serve uh, attendance any drinks or uh, desserts. Uh, it was 
maybe it was not so hard uh, to organize uh, the exhibitions uh, with this uh, precautions. However, the director prevented uh, any artwork produced to be presented uh, to the attendants. I had to think uh, of other ways to solve this problem. Uh, the best way was that the visitors can obtain an electronic catalog by scanning a barcode by their mobile phones to download the, the catalog. Moreover, I sent uh, the catalog to all friends uh, who was interested but uh, afraid uh, of the visit. Another good idea also that I can advise people who are in uh, the process uh, of running such as an event is to make sponsored ads on uh, social media uh, however it will cost uh, but will achieve high spread of artwork photos to ensure to reach the largest possible number uh, of people uh, interested in fine arts and also in new exhibitions. And thus you have been able to provide at least artwork photos for those who were interested but couldn't attend. There is another idea that I didn't implement but I think it is good, which is to uh, photograph the exhibitions uh, uh, with 3D panorama technique, which enabled the people to wander inside the exhibitions as if they had actually visited it. In the near future I will give it uh, a try uh, as well, it would be great to uh, spread uh, my art uh, all over the world uh, without uh, traveling. On the other hand, sure my artistic idea was somehow affected by the pandemic. The exhibition was called Soul Integration, uh, expressing the suffering of the human soul and how it, uh, it tries to heal at once. The suffering here is not uh, physical but uh, moral suffering. Uh, I expressed soul suffering by pandemic sculpture which are inspired by the movement of the human woman body that wriggles uh, from pain. Her body is full of wounds but she is trying to heal her wounds and uh, proceed in her life. I used various color symbols. Uh, symbolism uh, was used in, uh, in all works to express different emotions and feelings. The pandemic may have affected my philosophy a little, uh, but the main ideas is a moral suffering and uh, not physical suffering. Generally, I used to express soul suffering uh, reflected by woman body figures or houses also. They always have been the main subject of my art. Uh, concerning the material, I'm so much interesting to search and invent a new ways uh, to form ceramic and glaze application. Uh, in my last solo exhibitions, the sculpture work was ceramic stoneware uh, that was formed on metal structure after preparing a special ceramic body composition and a special mixture of the ceramic body as well to be thermally compatible with the metal structure during the firing. Uh, they were fired at temperature 1100 degree uh, and the cracks appears uh, after which the cracks was filled with glaze and fired again at temperature of 1050. This is all about uh, my this experience. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank you for your kind invitation, and I would like to all of, uh, people to uh, uh, and, and and I would uh, thank you uh, for your uh, kind listening. Uh, stay safe, be healthy. Goodbye. Dear audience and distinguished participants, I sincerely thank you for your attention on behalf of the organizers. Dear participants, it was a pleasure to listen to your analysis, hear new information and presentations as well as predictions for the times that will come after COVID-19 crisis. We have all learned something new and the passion for the African art is stronger 
in our hearts after this conference. Dear audience, thank you for following us on the YouTube channel of Core Media Communications. Many warm regards until the next conference is organized by Color Media Communications and the Museum of African Art in Belgrade. Thank you one more time and have a nice day.